All right, welcome back. Um, so before the break, uh, we looked at uh, the first seven verses of the Philippian letter. Uh, so we just got started. Um, and we see that Paul says in these first few verses that um, he thanks God every time he remembers this particular church. He says in verse 3, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So he says, your one church, which partnered along with me right from day one, you know, right from that first day when uh, um, uh, Lydia invited the missionaries to her home and she said, you know, I'm opening up my home to you all. Please come, come over here and be over here with us. So right from that first day, this church began to partner in the gospel with Paul. Um, and so he says that he is confident that God who began a good work in them will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Uh, so he, um, you know, when he writes to some of the churches, he is upset. Uh, he is angry because they have gone after wrong teachings. In some letters, we see that he is sad uh, because um, they have not caught the truths which he had wanted to convey. But here, when we look at this letter, he's full of joy even as he's writing it. He is so happy for the progress which he has seen in the lives of these believers. And so he says, you guys have partnered with me from the first day until now. And uh, because of that, he says, I, am, I pray with joy for you, he says. Um, and then he goes on to say in verse 7, um, since I have you in my heart and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. Okay, So he says that they have been partnering in the gospel with him. And he also says that they are sharing in God's grace uh, with him. Uh, you know, when we were doing uh, Ephesians, we looked at how there are four different forms of grace um, mentioned in the New Testament. So over here, when he's talking about how the Philippian believers are sharing in God's grace along with Paul, he's talking about the grace gifts. Uh, that's basically what he's referring to over here in verse 7. So the Philippian church caught the vision that they are not just going to be a bunch of uh, that that believers are not meant to be just be a bunch of spectators who just watch the show even as the leaders are leading they caught the vision that god wanted every living stone in the building you know that god is building up for himself the church which he's building up for himself every living stone has a role to play every living stone in this uh, uh, building that God is building, this living church which God is building, every living stone has a responsibility to fulfill. Every single believer is expected to minister in some way or the other, which is why that many spiritual gifts have been released. So it's not just the fivefold ministry gifts which were released. You have the ministry gifts which were given to which are given to every single believer uh, to perform some kind of role for the kingdom of God. So whether the person has been called into full-time ministry or not, every single believer has a ministry role. And plus, uh, apart from that, uh, you also have the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, which are, are just you know for the benefit of the believer to be used for his own personal growth, as well as for the benefit of the other believers around him. So this many spiritual gifts have been released uh, so that every believer can be an active participant in the gospel. Uh, and the Philippine church clearly understood this. So when they understood that God's grace 
that they are sharing in God's grace along with Paul, that they are sharing in the grace gifts along with Paul, they become ready to use their giftings to partner in the gospel. So it's not just Paul and the leaders who did ministry in Philippi. The Philippian believers also became fully actively involved in ministry work and you know, uh, did their best to reach out to their city and maybe even to the other communities around, uh, you know, um, outside the borders of their city. So we see this about this particular uh, church. And uh, the question we need to ask ourselves is, um, are we building up our churches in the same manner, helping them to catch the vision which the Philippian church did? Because today in most of our churches, most of the congregation is not even aware that they have been called to ministry. They think that their duty is to go and sit in that chair, you know, in the church on Sunday morning, participate in the worship, and then go home. They think that is their own one and only duty to the Lord. They are not even aware that they have ministry uh, roles to play in the church. They are not even aware that there is a, there is an entire set of ministry gifts which has been released, uh, you know, for each believer. So the leadership will have to create that awareness in the congregation that they are not meant to just be spectators. They are meant to actively participate in the gospel. The reason that the Philippian church could reach out to so many people to uh, reach out to their entire city uh, is because everyone in the congregation did their role, you know, played their part. But today, in our modern churches, we don't see the congregation contributing to the ministry work of the kingdom in any way. They are not even aware that they are supposed to contribute. They are not even aware that God has equipped them with ministry gifts which they can use to reach out to people. So um, it becomes the responsibility of those of us who are in leadership uh, to create this awareness in whichever church you know we attend, uh, to create an awareness over there that nobody, no believer is meant to be, has been appointed by God to just sit there as a spectator. We are all supposed to actively participate. And like we had seen um, when we were covering the book of Ephesians, the letter to the Ephesians, when we were covering that, we looked at how uh, it's the responsibility of the fivefold ministry leaders to train the other believers to be able to move in their particular giftings. So um, if an apostle sees a church member carrying that same gifting, that church member will continue to work in the secular office where he works. He'll continue to perform the secular duties we know which he, uh, he has been called uh, to perform by God. But he's going to use that apostolic gifting which he has in his heart, maybe to start a small uh, prayer group in his office. Uh, maybe he will use that uh, that apostolic gifting which he has inside him to start a small uh, Bible study in his colony. So you see, um, the average church believer, he also has a role to play. And uh, the fivefold ministry leaders will equip these believers depending uh, on their specialization. So uh, person uh, who's a full-time teacher, he may not be able to train someone in apostleship because he himself does not have that gifting, On the but then he is a teacher. So when he recognizes that that gifting of teaching in, the, in his church members, he goes to them, he encourages them, and he tells them, see, I can see this gifting in you. you. You have been given this ability by God to explain scriptures so clearly. Are you using this gifting? How can you use it? How can you use it in your own family circles? How can you use it in your neighborhood? And so uh, the full-time ministry person who's gifted maybe in this particular area of teaching will try to identify people in his congregation who have the ministry gift of teaching. So he would go to them and encourage them to get involved uh, in kingdom work and use their specific gifting to advance the kingdom. So if the fivefold ministers can 
specifically watch out for people who seem to have the same gifting that they have. They, of course, have the official full-time gifting. But if they recognize that same gifting in the form of a ministry gifting in the congregation uh, members, then they need to encourage that the congregation members also actively start using that particular gifting. So and a full-time evangelist, when he sees someone who seems to get very good results when you know whenever he goes and shares the gospel, the full-time evangelist recognizes that this particular believer in his church seems to be moving in this gifting because when he shares, people tend to actually get saved. You know, they, they, they get down on their knees, they confess their sins, and uh, they become part of the living church. So when the, uh, when the full-time evangelist recognizes this gifting in, in one of his congregation, he's supposed to go to them and tell them, you know, brother, I can see this gifting in you so clearly. Are you willing to uh, learn how to move in this gifting more and more? I can train you. I have experience. I can show you how to do it. I can give you tips, you know, practical tips on how you can uh, approach people, uh, talk to them. I can develop you in this area. Are you willing to give yourself to the Lord and, you know, use this ministry gifting? Now, you're not telling that person to come into full-time ministry because that is not the calling that they have been given. But they have a ministry gifting in their hands which they are meant to use. The Philippine church was partnering and using its grace giftings to contribute to the uh, kingdom work. But many of our modern churches are not doing that. So uh, just like Paul and his companions developed these Philippian believers to fully become uh, active in ministry, we too have to encourage our people in our congregations to become active in ministry because we saw last time when we were doing Ephesians, every believer is given ministry giftings. It may be hospitality, it may be the, it may be the gifting of helps, it may be uh, the, 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 the gifting of prophecy, whatever it is, we have to, uh, we in the leadership must encourage the congregation to use their ministry giftings because then we can reach a large city. Just a small bunch of believe, uh, leaders, you know, church leaders cannot cover the city on their own. We need the entire congregation to get involved in the kingdom work. Only then will the, will the, will the, will the gospel uh, spread and will only then will people be added to the uh, church. Okay, so these are things that we need to keep in mind. These are responsibilities that have been given to the fivefold ministry leaders, and they need to actively fulfill those responsibilities towards the congregation. Um, okay, moving on to uh, uh, a few other things. Um, if we could have someone read out for us, Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 18. There's a very uh, nice thought which Paul presents over here in this passage. So if we can have someone read out for us, Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 18. Philippians 1, 12 to 18, please. <clears throat> but I say, I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel so that it can it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to the rest that my chains are in christ and most of the brethren in the lord have become confident by my chains are uh, much more bold to speak the word without fear some indeed preach christ even from envy and strife and some also from goodwill the former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. Amen. Amen. So Paul 
you know literally shows his heart over here in these in these verses we get to know what kind of a person he is what drives him what motivates him what the deepest desire of his heart is he doesn't really care how the gospel is advanced you know even if people are trying to work against him and in the process of of working against him if they are spreading the gospel that's also fine by him as long as the gospel gets spread you know that is his passion so he says you know um, you philippian believers probably are feeling bad that you know i'm over here in rome in chains um because if you remember we talked about this when we were doing the background to ephesians we talked about how uh, paul gets arrested and sent to rome and during that time he writes this letter to the philippians so he sends this letter from rome to the philippian church so he says over here you know you people probably are feeling sad that i'm over here you know imprisoned under arrest uh, but uh, you know what this is actually worked to further the gospel this has led to the advancement of the gospel because because i'm sitting over here in chains everyone is talking about it you know they're talking about how uh i mean the, you know the, the details are not given here of course but then what we can understand what exactly has happened uh because here is a man who has been placed under arrest and he's now spending you know um, more than a year uh, in imprisonment not because he's done any crime of any kind the reason he's under arrest is because he preached about somebody named jesus christ so obviously everyone is curious they all you know in the in the palace everyone wants to know who is this man who is willingly staying under arrest not for having done any crime but simply because he talked about somebody named jesus and because he talked about this jesus it created a lot of furor among the jewish people so who is this jesus why are the jews so angry and upset about it why did they get him arrested and why is this man so happy to be arrested and you know uh, staying over here in imprisonment their curiosity is aroused and so what has happened to paul has actually worked to advance the gospel and so he's happy to be imprisoned you know most of us would not be very thrilled if we were thrown into jail yes jail can be an excellent place to uh, you know share the gospel but still you know we are rather reluctant to end up in jail um, but paul he doesn't mind being imprisoned uh, and he in fact rejoices that his imprisonment has led to the furtherance of the gospel and he goes on to say you know there are some people who are preaching not because they really love the lord or love the gospel they are preaching out of envy and rivalry they want to compete with paul and show you know how superior their teaching style is how how much better their communication skills are than this paul so they are not actually preaching to spread the gospel they are preaching just to show off you know how how superior they are to paul but paul doesn't mind he says no problem the gospel is getting advanced and that is what matters so he says there are some people who are preaching with all the wrong motives and of course there are others who are preaching out of good will he is glad for both types of people and he says in verse 17 uh the former preach christ out of selfish ambition not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me so these are preachers who are preaching out of selfish ambition uh um, they kind of want to uh um, pull people away from being followers of paul they want them to become followers of their own little you know uh ministry setups so they want to create trouble for paul uh by discrediting his teaching style by discrediting the things that he is sharing uh you know uh, and they want to build up their own ministries so they are preaching out of selfish ambition um but he says in verse 18 you know in the niv it says what does it matter the important thing is that in every way whether from false motives or true christ is preached and because of this i rejoice he says you know it just shows how much passion there was in this man's heart uh, for the gospel for people to be added to the kingdom for lives to be saved you know that is his 
deep passion why why what drove him to uh, preach the gospel with so much zeal he explains that in romans and i think it it's good for us to actually look at that um if we could have someone go to romans chapter 1 uh and read out for us verses 14 and 15 romans 1 14 to 15 we kind of get an idea of why he is so driven you know about sharing the gospel romans 1 14 to 15 please i am a data both to greeks and to the barbarians both to wise and to unwise so as much as a as is in me i'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are in rome also amen yeah now this is the letter to the romans so at that time he says i am a debtor to the greeks i am a debtor to the gentiles um, i mean the word barbarians is used over here because that's the that's the way the greeks looked upon all the other communities they considered this, themselves very um, civilized and superior and so they used this label of barbarians you know uneducated uncivilized that's the label which they used for all the other communities uh, but just that that basically is talking about the gentiles and gentiles are not barbarians uh, so that's just the uh, what um, corrupted greek perspective of the world so uh, that's basically how they used to look upon uh, the gentiles and so here uh, here when you know um, Paul is talking to the people in Rome he says i am a debtor to the gentiles i am a debtor to the greeks and that is why i am ready to preach the gospel uh, to everyone including to you people in rome the 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 thing which drove him to share the gospel with such passion was the fact that he looked upon himself as a debtor why in what way was he a debtor in what way did he owe these people you know in what way, what way is he in debt to them you see it all goes back to his um, encounter with jesus on the road to damascus because at that time jesus says to him um, you know uh, in uh, that that would be in your acts 26 verses 15 to 18 um, he he says to the lord who are you lord and then the lord speaks to him and the lord says Uh, i am jesus whom you are persecuting and then uh, the lord says uh, get up and stand on your feet i have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness and the lord goes on to say to him in verse 17 acts 26 verse 17 the lord says you know i'm going to send you out to the gentiles um, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light so um god says to him i am jesus whom you are persecuting and then in the very next sentence this jesus who is getting persecuted by paul he says to him you know what i'm going to use you i'm going to give you a very high status and position and role you're the person that i'm going to use to initiate this ministry among the gentile communities of the entire asia minor so um paul feels deeply indebted to the lord for this um, role that was given to him a man who was persecuting the church god takes such a person and makes him a blessing to the church so paul always values um, you know uh, what jesus did for him he was at such a low level god took someone like that and instead of you know spitting on him or you know uh, beating him or judging him god forgave him and turned him into such an amazing apostle so paul always had a deep sense of gratitude for this he felt indebted to the lord and not just that he says he he says he feels indebted to the greeks and indebted to the barbarians he feels that he owes them this duty to share the gospel to do something for them why because that is the commission that god gave him now how do you and i feel about the roles and functions that god has given to us 
again, like I said, you know, it doesn't matter whether I'm in full-time ministry or whether I'm, you know, in, working in the secular field. As a believer, what are the roles and functions that God has given me? And how much do I value them? You know, there was this one particular point in my ministry when I was not happy with what God had given me. I liked the ministry that God had given me before that. You know, it was like um, challenging, uh, into, I mean, adventurous. I, I felt very uh, enthusiastic about doing it. Um, there was a lot of good feedback, all of that. And then I got into this phase where God gave me this ministry where, I mean, there was no, not much happening. I mean, no publicity, no feedback. I'm just quietly doing my work day after day. Uh, and I don't know whether it's really impacting anyone, whether it's helping anyone. Very silent uh, phase. And uh, so at that time, God said to me, yes, it's good that you enjoyed what I gave you earlier. Yes, it's good that you gave your very best in that. But do you appreciate what I have put in your hands now? Just because the applause is missing, just because the you know, the, the the what the 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 the, the public uh, feedback is missing, um, are you now unhappy with what I have given you? So, are you serving me for the sake of fame and popularity, or are you serving me because you really want to serve me and and see people coming into the kingdom? I mean, that really pierced my heart, and I thought, oh. You know, in different phases of life, whatever role, whatever function the Lord gives, I need to feel indebted to the Lord that he put something so valuable into my hands. I mean, I'm just a human and he is willing to partner with me in this ministry work of bringing unsaved people into the kingdom. I should value that, you know. So uh, like Paul, we need to have a deep appreciation of what has been uh, given to us, the whatever ministry role it is, even if it is something as small as you know running a Bible study. Are we doing it with all our hearts, appreciating, valuing what God has put in our hands? Do we feel it, you know, indebted to, to the Lord to go and give our very best? If that is our attitude, then the Lord will be able to really bless what we are doing and bring much fruit out of it. So whatever we are doing, it will have eternal uh, you know, results uh, uh, because we are doing it with a true heart. Um, now coming to verses, OK, now, so now we are uh, looking at Philippians chapter 1. Um, if we could have someone read out for us verses 27 to 30. Yeah, uh, Philippians 1, 27 to 30, please. Uh, yeah, um, anyone who's, you know, in the class, attending the class, if you could unmute and read out for us Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 to 30. Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 to 30. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come or and see you, or oh, I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. Amen. Amen. Um, so here he says, you all have a role to play in this gospel of Christ. So you need to conduct yourselves in a manner that is worthy of this gospel. 
are you conducting yourselves in a manner which is worthy are you striving together you know so he says do not be frightened away by the opposition which may come against you because it has been granted to you on behalf of christ not only to believe in him but also to suffer for him you know because uh, most believers think that all that has been given to them is um the privilege of believing in him no there's one more privilege which has been given to them and that is the privilege of suffering for him you know uh, a lot of us want the first we do not want the second but in philippians chapter 1 verse 29 it is very clearly told that we are granted two things on behalf of christ one to believe in him and two to also suffer for him so we have to conduct ourselves in a manner that is worthy of this gospel and be willing even to suffer for him um so moving into chapter 2 he talks about how we are supposed to conduct ourselves in a worthy manner uh, what kind of a sacrificial life are we supposed to live with what attitude are we supposed to minister so those are the uh, details that he gets into uh, so in chapter 2 uh in verse 3 he says do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit you know because he he was talking in the previous chapter about those people who are uh, doing ministry work with all the wrong motives and intentions so he says don't be like that he says do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit rather in humility value others above yourself not looking to your own interests but each of you to the interests of others in your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus so he says um you philippian believers need to have the same mindset which Jesus had and then he goes on to explain what kind of a mindset Jesus had okay so yeah, verse 6 onwards he talks about that he says this was the kind of mindset which jesus had uh he did not okay verse 6 it says uh that jesus did not consider equality with god something to be used to his own advantage rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant um so um you know in in nkjv it says uh who being in the form of god did not consider it robbery to be equal with god um that's a rather unclear translation uh so niv brings it out better where it explains to us what that uh, greek root word harpazo what it means um jesus understood fully his status he fully understood that he is equal with god but having understood that he didn't grab on to it hold on to it desperately cling on to it no he did not consider it something you know to be used to for his own advantage rather it says in verse 7 he made himself nothing he lays aside this privilege this this uh, the special status which is his you know which is rightfully his he lays it aside and makes himself nothing so that he can take on the nature of a servant you know so um uh, the thing about our, our us believers we are very conscious of our rights and privileges you know so if 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 another and if another believer encroaches upon our rights you know we we immediately spring up and we say i know it's my right to have this who are you to you know come and uh, uh, obstruct me in this manner uh, so um if somebody speaks to us harshly say it's my right to be treated with respect and dignity what right do you have to talk to me like that so you know we are so conscious of our rights of our privileges um uh, but jesus who had the highest rights and the highest privileges what did he do with his rights and privileges he did not consider it harpazo something to be held on to something to be grasped no rather he lays it aside and he chooses to become a servant so that he can serve um and how does he serve verse 8 it says 
he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death so this is not like you know just serving at the table um serving by you know uh, washing people's feet it is service to the extent of death it's it's service of uh, that selfless a nature it's that kind of a service you know and it says in verse 8 um uh, he, uh, humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross uh, when we were looking at uh, galatians we talked about how the cross was something very demeaning in those days that word staros cross was not even used by polite people uh, p- polite people did not talk about crucifixion and things like that because you know it it involved humiliation it involved uh, being stripped of your clothes and being hung naked it uh, involved um, you know uh, torture and abuse and all of that so it is something so demeaning this jesus fully understanding who he is that he's equal with god sets aside all of those privileges all of that status to become a servant and what kind of a servant a servant who humbles himself to serve to the point of death and that was such a humiliating form of death a death on a cross and we are told to have that mindset in our christian walk it's a very high demand that is being placed upon us it's not something that we will ever be able to do in our own strength it's something that we can do only through the power of the holy spirit and so even as that desire rises in our heart to be like that to be like jesus you know we should cry out and say lord i really have this desire to be like that i don't want to be selfish me i want to be beautiful like jesus but lord i'm unable to do this on my own please enable me please help me daily remind me of this goal which i have set for myself and when i go astray correct me lord remind me of the stand that i have taken that i'm going to be uh, that i'm going to have the mindset of christ and not the mindset of the world so lord you help me you enable me and so when we eagerly reach out to him and ask him every day again and again with that hunger he will begin to change us so this is not something which will just fall into our laps we it's a it's a conscious choice that we make that we will start changing and we ask the holy spirit to help us make these changes and then because we are committed to this he will start you know um enabling us to become uh, what he wants us to be um so maybe we can um, maybe we can talk a little bit about this aspect of having the same mindset as christ um if you were to go to philippians chapter 4 you know from philippians chapter 4 we will look at just a few verses because in those verses it talks about having the same mind as the lord jesus uh, so we are not jumping from here into philippians chapter 4 we we will save that for next class but we will just look at these few verses philippians chapter 4 uh, verses 2 and 3 which talk about some believers who should have the same mind in the lord they are meant to have the same kind of mindset which jesus has so let's look, uh, you know go to philippians chapter 4 just to look at these uh, few verses so here in his letter paul is you know saying i plead with iodia and i plead with syntish i mean what names to give to your daughters right um so he you know he says i'm pleading with these two ladies to be of the same mind in the lord yes and i ask you my true companion help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel you know these are not just two average um, church members these are two ladies who have fought along with paul for the gospel they are committed leaders of the church 
And now, for some reason, there's some difference between them. Uh, they seem to be in disagreement and disunity regarding some matter. And so here, Paul says, please, uh, you know, uh, talk to them, uh, counsel them, so that they will they will be of the same mind in the Lord. Okay, so. Uh, they need to have the same mindset that the Lord has, and they need to uh, come together in unity. Uh, you know, uh, what was what was Jesus' mindset? We saw that in Philippians 2, where it says that he didn't consider his own interests, but he looked to the interests of the others. Um, so uh, we uh, so these two ladies, rather than thinking about um, their own opinion and their own point of view, they are being asked uh, to place others' interests before their own. So how does this work out in real life? I mean, you know, in an actual church setting, you will have situations where church leaders will disagree with, re with, with each other about decisions regarding the running of the church. You know, one one leader may say, you know, let's do it this way because then the church will really be benefited and we will be able to reach many people for the gospel. And then the other leader says, no, no, I think this is a, a better method. What I am saying is a better method. Please, let's implement this so that, uh, you know, uh, the church will be benefited. Both of them want to uh, benefit the church, but they are in disagreement on how to go about it. How would you resolve uh, an issue like that? Each of them is supposed to place the interests of the other before them, you know, rather than think of their own interests. So does that mean that each of them just caves in to the other person? It actually is talking about placing the interests of the church before their own, you know, a, a church as in all the believers, the entire community of believers. So both of them maybe can have a discussion along with all the other leadership, and then try to determine which would be more beneficial in the interests of the entire congregation. Even after having such a discussion, if they are still at a deadlock, and if it is leading to um, a lot of talk, and it's leading to a lot of strife in the church, then maybe it's time for one of them to just back off. Because sometimes, um, you know, uh, these discussions get heated. You will have about 20 church members saying, ah, I think the, what this person is saying is correct and we should follow this. And then you would have another ch other 20 church members, you know, um, siding with the other leader and saying, no, 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 what this person is saying is really better. We should do it this way. Now, what's happening? It started off as, some, as, a, as a discussion in the leadership, but now the congregation is getting involved. There's disunity happening in the church. So the, the leadership has to think about um, not their interests, but the interests of the church, the entire congregation, all the people, the, the flock that they are responsible for. So in case any um, disagreement becomes heated and starts spreading you know, uh, to an extent where it's affecting the congregation, then uh, one of the leaders should just back off, you know, for the benefit of the church, to preserve the unity of the church, uh, to not give Satan a chance to meddle in that in that beautiful church, you know, and 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 mess it up. So, for the sake of the church, one of the leadership, uh, one of the leaders, you know, who's you know tied into this argument, would choose to just back off. He would make that sacrifice. Uh, for the sake of preserving the unity. So here, uh, these two ladies, um, you know, are being requested by Paul to have the same mind in, in the Lord, you know, to have his same mindset and also to be united in their um, decision that they're going to place the church's interests before their own. You know, maybe both of them have uh, are right in what they are saying. Maybe both of their opinions have their pros and cons. But the benefit of the church becomes important. Uh, you know, if you in Philippians chapter 2, this is what we see in the first four verses. Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 1 to 4, uh, Paul says, 
if you have any encouragement from being united with christ if any comfort from his love he goes on to say if that is the case you know if you have received any comfort from his love then he says be like minded having the same love being one in spirit and of one mind is what yeah, paul says in philippians chapter 2 the first few verses so he is saying to the believers over there you know if you guys have received comfort from the love of christ then he says be like minded having that same love even in your own hearts and how would you express this love of christ by being united in your spirit by you being united in your mind so now whatever is being taught over here in philippians chapter 2 applies to the ladies in philippians chapter 4 so he's kind of drawing upon what he said earlier in philippians chapter 2 when he says to these ladies asks them to be of the same mind in the lord he's kind of you know pointing uh, back to what he had earlier shared in philippians chapter 2 so that's the reason why we you know kind of um, touched upon these verses um, even though we are actually dealing with philippians chapter 2 so when it comes to disputes when it comes to um, any arguments and disagreements the main importance should be given to the interests of the entire congregation what will benefit them most what will cause the church to grow uh, and we should be willing to sacrifice our opinion even if it means losing the argument it doesn't matter what matters is that the church gets built up okay so which is why paul you know he says in philippians chapter 2 beginning he says uh, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit he says so uh, uh, we need to remember that in our christian walk we must always have the mindset of christ who fully understanding his high status chooses to set it aside so that he can serve so we too should be people who are willing to serve and um, um, so then uh, paul goes on to say um, in verse 12 he says therefore my dear friends as you have always obeyed not only in my presence but now much more in my absence continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling he says um, so we have about three minutes so let's cover this and the rest of it of course we will you know we'll continue it in the next class um, so uh, he says uh, he asks these believers to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. Wrong doctrines have come out of this uh, statement because people have misunderstood what Paul has said over here. They say, oh, we are supposed to work out our salvation, is it? Does that mean that we have to add good works to our belief in Christ? Only then will we be saved? And that too, you know, uh, it says over here, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So does it mean that if I am not attaching enough good works to my faith in Christ, then there's a chance that I may lose my salvation? So with fear and trembling, should I add a lot of good works to my faith in Christ so that at least that will get me into heaven? You know, so these are all the wrong kind of thoughts and doubts which come into people's minds when they read this particular portion. Uh, but over here, he's talking about working out our salvation in a completely different sense. And when he uses that phrase, fear, fear and trembling, he, he means something very specific, which has got nothing to do about uh, losing our salvation, about, you know, about having the fear of losing our salvation. So all of these interesting details, we shall look at in, the, in our next class, you know, when we meet. Um, so we have kind of stopped today at verse 11. Uh, so verse 12 onwards, we will um, continue in our uh, next class. Uh, so um, let's just close with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for the truths that we could learn from your word today. We pray, O oh Lord, that whenever we require these truths, we would use them as the sword of the spirit to demolish the arguments which Satan raises, which he uses to try and tempt us away from you, O oh Lord. Lord, we pray that um, like the Philippian church, each of us 
who are just members in the church would take our ministry responsibility seriously that we would not regard ourselves as spectators but that uh, but to look at look at look at ourselves as people who are supposed to be active participants in the sharing of the gospel we pray oh lord that we would um, live in that way purposefully proactively rather than being passive help us oh lord uh, to live in a way that pleases you and honors you thank you lord in jesus name amen amen thank you so much we will be continuing uh, the philippian letter uh, next class